It's great to welcome to the program today Richard Griffiths, who's president of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, an organization that's dedicated to encouraging open government, free expression and independent journalism. Uh, so great to talk to you, Richard. Really appreciate it. Thank your time. you for having me. So listen, we've been talking at the federal level about what I've been seeing as red flags when it comes to press freedom. And this a, a lot of it has been coming from the Oval Office. It includes everything from threats of making it easier to sue media outlets, journalism licenses, uh, refusal of interview or even spots in the press room at the White House based on the sort of uh, perceived uh, friendliness to the administration. But it's not just at the federal level that there are things happening when it comes to press freedom. A lot of stuff, as in many other areas, seems to be happening at the state level. Is that right? I would argue that that's probably true, too, although there's probably less chance for traction at the state level, um, although you can certainly throw up a lot of impediments. Let's we talk. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say the Ethics and Journalism Act specifically in Georgia is something that uh, many people probably have not heard of, but which ha which would have a significant impact on on journalists work. Well, this was a bill dropped right at the end of the legislative session. It became public on the 2nd of April, which was the last day, and was filed on the 1st. And I, I thought it was an April Fool's joke initially. But what it proposed was a journalism oversight board, a board uh, appointed initially by the chancellor of the University of Georgia, the board to be based at the very prestigious Grady College of Journalism at uh, UGA, uh, to be made up of three editors, three news producers, two web uh, journalists, and one retired journalism professor. And the bill suggests that the uh, folks there, the nine folks, would create a canon of standards for journalism um, and accredit journalists within the state and enforce the professional standards uh, for journalism in the state. Um, the bill would also require that all outtakes from interviews, such as this one, um, would have to be provided to the interviewee within three days of a request. So um, uh, outtakes, interview notes, all photographs, it, it's sort of an, a harassment measure against existing journalism. And, and in a not so subtle dig at journalists, the, the bill would require that the journalists turn over the outtakes and photographs within three days, which is precisely the same period that government in Georgia has to respond to the Open Records Act. Um, there's no way, thankfully, that this bill will pass. At least I don't think it can pass. And even if it did pass, um, the governor of Georgia has said that he won't sign it. And I doubt there would be enough votes to uh, sustain it. But it does present a really interesting insight into what I describe as the zeitgeist now in the country. Now, this bill was uh, proposed by six really well-educated people who are respected in the legislature. There's a former missionary uh, who also works as a contractor. There's a pharmacist. There's a doctor, a lawyer, a retired county agent who's chair of the education committee. And there's a real estate development developer behind this. They're all Republican. Uh, they're, as I said, well thought of. They come from predominantly rural areas. And 10 years ago, they would have been the laughing stock for pushing a bill like this. Now, I think the tone has changed so much, such that there's such, um, on the Republican side, such disdain for mainstream media uh, that they have a pass to do it. And probably when they went back to their districts, they got slaps on the backs and attaboys. Um, and that that is a really disturbing trend. If you if you look at the latest Edelman trust trust survey that 
that came out in January. It's a, a global survey with an amazing 0.6 margin of error. And in the US, um, 69% of Democrats uh, said to trust the media, but only 23% of Republicans. Now, that is a startling disconnect, and that's the thing that scares me the most here, and, and really is why bills like this can come up and, and get traction. Yeah, I mean, there's this, earlier in the program, we talked about, uh, about this in regard to the debate that is going on as to whether children who are being kept in what are effectively large cages at the border deserve soap and bedding where there's a creeping normalization. If 20 years ago you try to jump right to that part of the debate, you get no traction whatsoever. But over time, as the sort of Overton window is pushed a little more and more in a particular direction, then all of a sudden it seems at least in some circles reasonable to debate something like the accreditation of journalists. Well, I think um, this is not just a U.S. issue. Uh, I do a lot of work in Eastern Europe uh, helping news organizations there deal with uh, threats against their operations. And particularly in Poland, uh, you see uh, efforts there to control the press. And, and there it started with adjustments into the constitution of the courts and who could be a judge and how long one could stay a judge. So existing judges who had lots of experience were removed and then the judges who were put in were much more hostile to a free press. And there the independent journalists um, are under assault um, for their ownership, because some of them are American owned, some of them are, have German, partial German ownership. And so the attacks come as a sort of a licensing component. But it is all about um, the threat to the government that independent journalism presents. And when the uh, government in question is hanging on by a thread, as is the case in Poland, they have a very narrow majority. Uh, so the efforts to constrain the press become more vigorous. Now, I don't want to draw too many comparisons to Georgia, but Georgia for the first time is a state in play. And I suspect that also comes as part of it here. You have folks who are really wanting to pump up their base and wanting to uh, get folks really enthusiastic and out of the polls. And the uh, media, frankly, is uh, the bogeyman for a lot of Republicans. And, and it's easy to charge people up and, and get people fired up by attacking a free and independent press. Yeah, it's been incredibly successful to use this uh, fake news term to basically become a catch all for anything that contradicts the pre existing narrative that may exist in some political circles or that is critical of the current administration. And what's most disturbing to me is not that this is something that the current administration has attempted, but the success that has come with it. I mean, you know, the, the number of tweets and YouTube comments that I get daily saying that my program is fake news is probably not altogether surprising because whatever is kind of in, in the, the insult of the day. I am the recipient of, but the serious way in which, as you point out, it has affected particularly Republican voters into believing that at some fundamental level, basic news reporting cannot be trusted. That partisan divide is what shows me how effective it's been. Well, I think there's another thing that journalists like us have to look at each other in, in the face and, and say, we have allowed ourselves to become too siloed. Um, and uh, part of the breakdown in trust is that we have not necessarily have been as transparent as we should be about our processes. Uh, there's That's a interesting. In, in what in what sense do you mean? Well, I think that the, the public often look at institu large journalism institutions and they don't know how the magic happens. They don't know the amount of work that goes into reporting out a news story. Mm. How, how many 
calls got made, how many uh, documents were examined, how many FOIA requests were made, how many efforts were made to get somebody who didn't speak to speak. And we're not transparent enough uh, about that process. There's a terrific initiative coming out of the University of Georgia and Pointer, uh, the Trusting News Initiative, where they're actively working to coach news organizations to push openness and transparency, even go so far in some uh, newsrooms to open up their editorial meetings to Facebook Live so people can see how those editorial discussions go. Hmm. How is the newspaper going to be stacked tomorrow? What's going to be the lead story? What stories are they choosing and why are they choosing those stories? Um, at, at CNN, when I was there, there was a, a lot of action on our part towards explaining why we did stories and how we did them and what the process was for reporting out those stories. Those are all the kinds of things that help build trust. But as I say earlier, uh, it, it's, it's one step. It's not uh, the total solution. It, you, we, we've got to figure out other ways of winning back that trust. I agree 100 percent. I think the other side of this, and I'd be curious to hear your thought about it in the limited time we have, is the lack of media literacy that we increasingly have in this country. I uh, recently adjunct taught a course on critical thinking and new media at Boston College, and a huge component of it was just explaining to students what the differences are between something like fake news and something like simply that there is editorial bias in a story and being able to distinguish between news and opinion journalism, understanding that anonymous source doesn't necessarily mean anonymous to the journalist, but it is a, a, a source's identity that may be kept private from the public perspective. All of these basic things to me seem to be completely missing from education right now. I, I completely agree with that. Um, I uh, teach at the University of North Carolina uh, each year, and uh, there's an intro course that's a, a big survey course taught by the dean that I help uh, with. And those kids are everything from pre-meds to future journalism major to chemistry majors who you know have to fulf fulfill some uh, preliminary requirements. And uh, they're very startled to hear that what journalists actually do know the names of of sources um, uh, precisely the point. But also, you know, we as journalists need to be much more careful about how we identify our guest. Is the person who's on the air a reporter delivering a report? Yes. Or like me, uh, somebody who's giving their opinion on 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 journalism based on years of experience. So I'm. I'm certainly uh, an, an opinion person. I'm not a reporter, although I played that role in my career. So identifying uh, uh, who we have on the air, who the people are in the stories providing their expertise is absolutely critical. Yes. Well, on that note, Richard Griffiths is president of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, and he has been here giving us his opinion uh, on the basis that he has informed that opinion uh, uh, personally and not here as a reporter. Uh, Richard, really appreciate your time today on, on this really important issue. Thank you for having me on.